Our next speaker um, probably needs no introduction, which is quite good because I think we're running a wee bit behind now. Um, that's Dr Andrea Byram. I will say something though from her bio she's given me, um, which you could speak at length about, but um, uh, one interesting fact you might not know about her is that for her uh, honours degree she studied the gen genetics of freshwater copepods. Now I was interested in this because I don't know what a copepod is. If you don't know, it's, a, it's those little crust, it's those teeny weeny little bugs they live in fresh water, is that right? Yes. Yeah, little crustacean bugs. Hey. <laughs> anyway, on that note, um, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Andrea Byram. Oh, well, kia ora koutou. Um, thanks very much, Melanie and Amanda, for inviting me to come and speak in this session. And really where this talk is coming from is that about 18 months ago, several of our Māori researchers in the Science Challenge stood up in front of the New Zealand Ecological Society and um, talked about their experience in trying to embed vision mātauranga and mātauranga Māori into the Science Challenge. And so 18 months on, you've just seen a, a sort of revised version of that. And we always said it would be really interesting if I gave my perspectives, I guess. Um, so these, this is very much a personal viewpoint, I guess. Um, so a few weeks ago uh, in Christchurch, I marched for science. And that's actually one of the few times in my life that I've ever got out on the streets in protest. And here's a few of the reasons why I marched for science. So everyone had their own reasons for marching for science, of course. Uh, some of it was around global change. Some of it was around diversity. For me, it was about evidence-based policy. It was about diversity in science. It was about science as being a part of society and not separate from it. It was a belief that science makes a difference in our lives and that it was kind of an anti-Trump protest, if I'm honest with myself. <laughs> and it was also very much for me about in, um, bringing in a variety of world views into the science that we do. And a couple of days later, this really interesting blog came out in the Vox, and it was, it was the title it was, Science is Already Political, So Scientists White Might As Well March. And it made for very interesting reading because it spoke about this thing called science theory, which is what we know of as sort of um, hypothesis-driven testing and experimentation, versus science practice, which is the institutions, norms, and people doing science. And I realised that actually this is what I marched for and not the top one. So I didn't go in there saying, with a big sign, saying, hypothesis-driven research. I went in there because I believed in all those other things. And that, for me, really was um, the turning point. And when Melanie and Amanda told me they were going to mention the March for Science, I thought, ah, that's how maybe I can connect with this audience. So for me, bringing in vision mātauranga and mātauranga Māori into our science is really about a slightly wider context and science, doing science in a much wider context than perhaps we've done before. So for me, uh, my research background, just like Amanda described, is actually pretty shameful. Uh, we never really engaged very much with Māori communities. We tried, but um, time was a factor and funding was always a factor. And then, as, just exactly as Amanda said, we didn't always see how we, our research could be relevant, even though we're working on pest animals, and these are major threats to New Zealand's native flora and fauna. So guess what? It was highly relevant, and we could have done better. And then a few years down the track, and um, I stood in front of a mock panel of interviewers to do this job as the director of the Science Challenge, and one of them was Phil Liver. And Phil said to me, right, describe to me what's in the Vision Mātauranga policy, and I went. And so that was really the starting point for me to go, okay, I really need to learn about this and figure out how we're actually going to give effect to this policy in the science challenge if I'm going to be the director. And of course when I read it, the four themes, and we've done a lot of work and a lot of water under the bridge in the challenge now, but these four themes of course resonate really well with the four pillars of well-being that are essentially the um, four pillars and or four desired outcomes in our science challenge anyway. And then in addition to that, if you delve down into the detail of the VM policy, it's very much about 
seeking transformational change, even if it doesn't quite say it exactly like that. So designed to inspire researchers, all researchers, to find innovative solutions and encouraging the innovation potential of all of those involved, not just Māori. And then much more recently, there was this interesting article by Daniel Hikaroa in the Journal of the Royal Society. It came out just a little bit earlier this year where he's delved into what is Mataranga. And I should say at this point that there's lots and lots of academic um, and scholarly pursuit of this topic. And I'm not going to go into that, nor do I claim to be an expert in any way, shape or form. But this paper does distill it down quite nicely. Um, to different ways of, different frameworks within Mataranga to understand the environment. So Purako, or traditional narratives, and also Marumataka, the lunar calendar. And that makes a lot of sense, of course, when you're thinking about being embedded in your environment. You need to know a lot about it, and especially if you are uh, working with natural resources and living in a sustainable way. The fundamental difference that Daniel identified in terms of difference between um, classic scientific process and mataranga was that mataranga tends to include values. But, and so it's not the same as scientific method. And I was relieved to hear that because I marched for this kind of science, I guess. Um, but having said that, and just to confuse people, he also comments that some mataranga knowledge is generated according to scientific method. And so it was really important to separate these two views and also to ensure that um, we give voice to mataranga knowledge through our, scient our wider scientific processes. And in talking to a few different people, in a way this is akin to natural history. Now, I'm sure that by saying that I'm actually going to offend some people and I don't intend to. What I mean is that this fundamental understanding of, of our environment and living in it and how we live is actually very much akin to, it's fundamental to how we do our science. It would have to be a starting point almost. So where's the evidence that including mataranga in our research would enhance our ability to manage our environment? Um, this again is an area of academic, um, active academic pursuit and I'm going to give you three examples, one past, one current and one future broadly related to this science challenge. And so the first one is this, is actually a paper by uh, uh, Gail Tipper, who's on our ka um, Kahui Māori, who wrote about bringing the past into the future and using historic data to inform contemporary freshwater management. She did this with some colleagues in Niwa. And to cut a very long story short, what they did is they went through back through a whole heap of interesting stuff, like historical documents, photographs, um, Fano manuscripts, stuff that were in people's garages, you name it, cultural maps, a whole heap of things, some very interesting stuff, and they actually pieced together what the environment looked like in the Waitaki Valley, uh, in, in um, Otago, or North Canterbury and Otago. And I thought this was quite interesting because, you know, um, I guess a biophysical approach to this would be to do paleoecology or something equivalent. But this is a different way of piecing together the kind of information that you might need. And what they ended up doing was actually being able to manage natural resources in the Waitaki region collectively with Department of Conservation, Meridian Energy, a whole bunch of farmers um, by bringing that extra knowledge into that resource management framework. And it's quite a successful example. And so each of those place names that they've got there on that map actually tells us a lot about traditional resources. So that's just the first example, a bit of a historic look back. Our most recent example is a paper that a bunch of us published just last year in this challenge where we looked at how do we restore New Zealand's biological heritage by 2050. Um, so that's published in Ecological Management and Restoration. And basically what we did, and especially I'd like to thank Phil Liver for this, was building a Te Ao Māori perspective into biodiversity and land and water restoration. Now we're not the first people to write about this by any stretch of the imagination, but certainly this is, was the first time that we'd actually done this under a science challenge umbrella and really started to think about how do we actually build in these viewpoints and, and um, processes into the challenge and into science. 
And then finally, I also want to stick with the Phil Liver theme, and I know that Phil and Puki are coming up shortly, um, around thinking about customary approaches and practices to building both cultural and ecological resilience in ecosystems. And the reason I mentioned this particular project is I asked Phil a question um, quite a while ago now where I said, you know, we do know that lots of humans around the world have actually trashed natural resources, and in some instances, indigenous people are no exception. And I thought, I mean, that's, as an aside, being able to ask confronting questions in this challenge has been real godsend for me, and I, I'm really appreciative of that. But Phil gave me a very interesting answer. He said, this project is not about upholding indigenous resource management as the gold standard and everything else not working. He said, this is about a contemporary context. It's about bringing in a couple or three or more different world views into how we manage our resources and moving forward together. And I'm sure you're probably going to hear a little bit more about that over the next little while. And I found that really useful, and I really hope that that's the kind of thing that will be transformational in our science challenge. So my big crazy idea is actually not very crazy at all. My suggestion to a number of the non-Māori researchers in the room is please engage with us. Please sit back and read some of these things. The things I've put on the screen there are just the things I've talked about today. But even I, delving into doing some background reading for this talk, realised there's a huge amount of scholarly stuff out there that lots of people are far more experienced than I am and have worked on for a long time. So please have a read of some of these interesting things. Read the VM policy and also talk to our colleagues. And I'm going to leave the last word to Jamie Ataria, who I think has gone by now, unfortunately. I did warn him that I was using this quote. But I, I emailed them, um, a number of the researchers in this challenge, a copy of my abstract. And um, Jamie sent this email back to me, which was very funny. So I'll leave you to read that. And I guess to answer my question that I posed at the beginning, why should we engage? Bringing in multiple forms of knowledge is a good thing. It's healthy to have diversity. And as Kim said and alluded to this morning, it's about transformational change. Uh, to some extent, silencing science does come from within, and that's what my colleagues were meaning when they, they talked about us sometimes being blind to different approaches and different world views. It's time to work together to find a way to engage and to find spaces for people like me to ask stupid questions and not be run out of town, and I've really, really appreciated that in this challenge. And that's about it from me. Thank you. Kia ora, Andrea. Um, I, I wonder if we've probably got time for maybe just one question. Yes, down the front there. Kia ora. Yeah, actually I have something to say about that. So what, um, what she said was that it's interesting to have been out of this for a while and come back and seeing the same things and the same discussions happening. I guess probably that if I'd had one parting shot it would have been that the Vision Matauranga policy is great, but I think we're still struggling with implementation. I know my colleagues agree with that as well. So we've actually talked a lot about this in the science challenge is there still feels like a big gulf and there shouldn't be, and so how do we overcome that? And I don't know all the answers, but I know we're, we're working our way actively towards trying to get there. Kia ora, Andrea. Show your appreciation, please. Thank you. <laughs> Can I just say, we are also, we are very lucky to have Andrea um, driving the challenge too. Um, I have to say I've only been in the role a couple of months, but I've been really encouraged and 
um, you know, uh, yeah, encouraged by the by the positivity and enthusiasm that people like Andrea show. So, kia ora, Andrea.